these two guys collectively together know as much about meats and meat science, beef, beef production, uh, is any two that I know. So let's give them a nice round of applause. All right, I got to say it. Howdy. Howdy. There's, a, there's a few of you around. That's okay. Hey, Ty, as I told Ty, the reason I'm here is because I want to just be with y'all because there's no doubt that he could far surpass anything I can do here. So that's the best part of this uh, facility is, is you have awesome people here too. So great facility, wonderful people, people that um, well-trained that love Texas and want to support you just like Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Our goal is, is to support you as stakeholders. We want to see you be successful. And so I sure appreciate Andy and all that he does because as I've come to learn from him over the years as an agent, his heart is with you. He wants you to do the, be in the best position that you possibly can. So today we're going to talk about carcasses. We're going to talk about meat. We're going to talk about value as you go from a live animal all the way through to the final box beef product and even talk about how those products are used by the consumer. How many of you have, you all went through cavernous? Did everybody go through cavernous or not everybody? There was about uh, four or five of us. Okay, so those that went through cavernous. Anybody ever been through cavernous or Tyson's or Cargill? So you've been in a meat plant, so you've seen it go, and it's going like 100 miles an hour, and everybody's cutting meat and going different directions. There is a purpose to what they're doing. And before this is over with, you're going to be an expert grader, an expert live animal evaluator, and you'll understand more than you ever thought you could understand about how cattle and the value of cattle go from the live animal through the carcass. Here's a, car here's a data sheet that you might want to write down if you have some place to write. Because I'm going to explain, you're going to know how this sheet works before the end of this, this uh, workshop. So this is, if you just Google National Weekly Cattle and Beef Summary, you'll see a lot of great information through that. But there's also information about what's the live steer value, what's the dress steer value, what drives that value. Well, drop, drop credit. We're going to talk about drop credit. What is that? Where did that come from? Okay, and you'll understand what that means before this is over with. Then also, you'll understand cutout value. That actually is what drives the price of your cattle. What you sell the meat for as you go from the packer to the retailer or food service establishment, what you sell that meat for sets the price. And they know about two weeks out what that price is. They've already locked in their contracts, everything, at least two weeks to four weeks ahead of time in a lot of cases. And so that's what is driving the price of your cattle as we go forward. So let's talk about, and first thing is I want you to take this one sheet. You should have my handout of slides. You're welcome to use that as you want. This is more important, this one that has one side on, has called quality grade, the other side's called yield grade. We're gonna be using that pretty much throughout the day. And so as we do that, Let's teach you how to quality and yield grade. Well, you're kind of going to say we're starting in the middle. And that's why I think if you know what we're actually looking at, what we want to, what we're actually looking at when we look at this live animal, when we show the hide off and the ribeye and the carcass and all of that, you'll have a much better idea of when you look at that live animal, what you're trying to estimate. Today, you're going to have a real treat. We've got three exhibits back there that will be rolled into this room. We have two steers and one cow. Okay, and there we're gonna be able to talk about value on both of those. How many of y'all sell cows to the auction market that actually would end up in cavernous someday? We'll talk about what drives the price of that also as we go through here. And then you're gonna see piles of meat from one side of each animal. And Dr. Lawrence is gonna talk about the value through each one of those. So let's, grading is a lot of cases, we just talked about choice select spread being almost $60. You better know how to quality grade. So I'm gonna teach you how to quality grade. So let's do that. The quality grading system is a system that's done by this person right here. This is the USDA grader. Guy with a blue hat, he works for Ag Marketing Service of USDA. He's the third party that's put in that facility 
for the purpose of estimating the quality grade and actually putting the actual quality grades and yield grades on these carcasses. That is what's used to base off the price of both the meat as well as what you receive if you're selling that animal on a carcass basis. So that person's doing it. It's a voluntary system. Carcasses don't have to be railed off. They don't have to be graded. But most of the feed yard steers and heifers that we have that come out of these feed yards go to a packing plant and they go by this grader who assesses the carcasses for grade. So what is this person looking at? Well, first of all, we'll step back and let's talk about the conversion of the live animal to the carcass, and it's called dressing percent. So of a live animal, what percent of the animal ends up in the form of a carcass? So you have a live animal here, you do all the harvest. What comes off during the harvest process? Hide, that's probably the number one weight thing. What else? What? Hoofs? Guts, oh yeah, that's the number two. Inter uh, ruminants have pretty big guts. That's what makes them different from pigs. Okay, we got blood. Sometimes on cows, we might actually have a fetus. That happens occasionally. So that's a reduction. So those are all things that as you go from a live animal to a carcass, you lose that weight. All the items, when we pull, when they come off the carcass uh, as on the harvest floor, those things are also called drop. They just dropped off the carcass. Also, we might call them dress off. We're undressing the animal. So those two things are terms that we use as we go from the live animal to the carcass. In the panhandle of Texas, the average dressing percent is 64%. So if you have a thousand pound animal, that means you're gonna result in a carcass of 640 pounds. So a dressing percent of 64 of the thousand pound animal 64% ends up in the form of a live an, uh, carcass, and that means a 640-pound carcass. Now, what am I going to do? If I sell an animal on a carcass basis, everything in between the live animal and carcass, I'm not getting paid for that anymore, right? If I'm the producer and I'm selling on the carcass basis, that weight in between. Well, how does that impact the value of that carcass? Well, they, they figure that into what they can offer you from that carcass. They figure it back in in the form of something called drop credit. Drop credit is all the value of everything that drops off the animal between slaughter and carcass, between harvest, a live animal and carcass. Everything that drops off they call drop credit. What's the number one valued item for something that comes off on a carcass during that process? The hide. In fact, 85% of the value of an animal is the hide that comes off of the harvest floor. So I want to start with that because that's a value indicator. What if I had a 65% and in case one of these animals is going to have almost a 68% dressing percent. I have a lot more carcass left over don't, that I'm actually selling. So that dressing percent impacts the value of your animals. So I wanted to mention that. Now let's talk about first of all this sheet. On one side of the sheet are the information that you have for quality grade which we call marbling, and then the quality grading chart. This is what the USDA grader uses. And in a minute, you're going to use it to grade some carcasses. Okay, so that's that side. The other side is the yield grade. Okay, you can kind of look at this animal as you come down through here. And this is the ribeye. This is actually right in the middle of that animal. And that's what that ribeye would look like on that animal versus this animal. And we'll talk more about the yield grade. It's quality grade, let's go back. This quality grade is an estimate of what? How good the meat's gonna what? Taste, taste. The juiciness, the flavor. Because we all know prime on the average is better than select, right? It's definitely better than utility. Okay, so Quality grade is an estimate of taste. What is yield grade an estimate of? How much meat that animal has. What percent of that animal is meat? Okay, so what's this grader looking at when they look at grade? Uh, first of all, if you went into the plant, you would see they actually have a, an instrument that helps them grade. It takes a picture of the ribeye. It's a camera called E plus V. That's the camera there. 
takes a picture of the ribeye and actually gives data to them that's used in the evaluation for quality grade and yield grade. So here's a picture, that's the actual ribeye. This is actually, they digitize it. You'll notice the ribeye right there. That's the ribeye, we call it ribeye. These other muscles are not the ribeye, just that one muscle, it's also the long isthmus muscle. Look at the flex inside that. What do we call those flex of fat inside the muscle? Marbling, so you guys are gonna win the contest, whatever that is. Good job, that's marbling. And so the more marbling, the better on the average, the better tasting the meat's going to be. That's why you impact tenderness, juiciness, and flavor. So that, just know the grader doesn't have to do this on their own because they're grading 6,000 animals in a day. A grader will probably look at at least 3,000 exhibits throughout the day. And so they've got to be able to do that pretty quickly. All right, quality grade, estimate of taste. So what factors in this chart? And this chart was developed starting way back in the 20s. It's been uh, changed over time. The last major chain was in 1989. As you look at it, across the top of this chart it says carcass maturity. Down the side it says marbling. This is important because we're going to have one cow in this group. So how do you know it's a cow? What, what happens when you have a cow? Well just know on average cows are not really officially graded, but there is a grading system for them. Why don't you grade cull cows? Their slang grades that they use, like cutter cow and you know lean 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 boner and break breaking bone or uh, lean breaker things like that. But why why don't you why don't you grade cull cows? Remember what's quality grade for? Juiciness, tenderness, and flavor. And you know one thing that really makes meat tender. Guess guess what the kind of one of the number one thing. Put it through a grinder. Good 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 or cut it into lean strips. That's what these cows are used for predominantly. They'll take some steaks from like the tenderloin and some other places, but those rounds are almost exclusively used for jerky or ground round. The rest of it is used for ground beef, other than a few steaks and roasts that they might pull along the way. So it's important to kind of know how this works, but look, so we have A, B, C, D, and E. That's as the letter gets further in the alphabet, the animal is getting older. I'll show you the age range for each of these in just a second. But A maturity, the majority of animals that come out of a feed yard are A maturity. That's going to make it pretty easy because we're going to just assume that most of the cattle are A maturity that we look at. So it's A maturity. Then B, C. Notice there's a white line here and there's a whole different set of grades once it crosses into that C. So that one cow that you'll see actually crossed over into this area. And so you're going to look at somewhere in this range for that cow, and that, that cow can be commercial, utility. This is actually cutter, and this is canner. What do we do with canner? The number one thing people say, the number one thing we do with canner is, and that's wrong. But that's what everybody says, dog food. No, it's put into Campbell's soup. Uh, nothing wrong with it. You know, I'm putting it through a grinder, it's going to be tender, it's just I'm going to add some other flavorings to it to kind of make sure that that doesn't necessarily, those off flavors from eating the grass and all the, all the other stuff doesn't impact it. There's nothing wrong with that beef from any of these animals if they've gone through inspection and passed for safety and wholesomeness. All right, so with that in mind, let's kind of keep that. But we're going to really spend most of our time on this side of the chart, A and B maturity, show you what, how they determine that. But notice those that are A maturity, which is the majority of cattle that come out of feed yards, are prime, choice, select, and standard. All right, so we've got that. So how do we determine age? Well, we're going to look at the skeleton. That's why they call it carcass maturity, because we don't have birth records. Only about 20% of the cattle could we even have birth records if we wanted them. Yeah, that's part of our trace back system that we just don't really have in our industry. So what happens is, is they're going to look at something to do on the carcass, and there are some neat physiological changes that both Andy and I have experienced in our own personal lives in the last couple years. And we'll talk about that. But there are physiological changes as you get older. All of you know that, right? And then secondly, secondly, as the animal gets older, the meat gets darker. So an animal that's A maturity is between nine months and two and a half years, 30 months of age. B maturity, 30 to 42. After 42, you get in that C maturity, those other grades. 
So again, majority of cattle, when they're harvested, on the average, you know, you're looking at, what, 16 to 22 months of age, probably cattle coming out of a feed yard, on average. So they all fit, majority of them, within that A maturity range. All right, so we've got that. So how does a grader, because I have them going by me at the rate of one every six to eight seconds, how do I look at this as they're being pulled in front of me? How do I look at the age of the animal? Well, I'm going to turn over here and let's look. What in, as it's coming by, I'm going to quickly look at the very tips of the backbone. So that, remember, the hide would be right here. Okay, and this is a fat layer. And underneath that fat layer is a bone. That's actually part of the spine. It's called a spine feather bone or spinous process on the very end of that is a cartilage tip you can see that as you look here now this is a carcass that's hanging by its Achilles so that's the round that's the head would have been down here on the floor all right so as you look at that you take a look so look at this is that button that I'm talking about it's a nice cartilage button as the animal gets older it gradually turns to bone see a little bit of bone in that button see a lot more in this one totally bone so that's very old so why, why I compared that to Andy and me is because we both have had knee replacement. So you ever have a doctor, if you're older, say, I have bone on bone, right? So I used to have a nice layer of cartilage between this bone and this bone. As I got older, that cartilage itself turned into bone. So now I have bone rubbing against bone as I walk. And so it's a gradual thing in all animals that happen, that those animals, as they get older, that cartilage turns to bone, and we can... So by God's grace, we have an instrument to tell the age of the animal very quickly by looking at that. So here we are. So as we take a look at that, now we've determined that they're A maturity. We're going to just kind of go off of A maturity now. We also can use teeth. I will point that out. So as you look at teeth, as you look at that system over here, you know, that's an animal of all of its baby teeth. Those are the permanent incisors that break through at about 18 months of age. And then at 24 months of age, that second set of permanent incisors start coming in. It's a gradual process. If they look at a carcass and they see that second set of permanent incisors, at least one tooth breaking through, then they call that animal over 30 months. That is also another way, if it's less, if it doesn't have that, they'll say that animal could also be a maturity. So that does now play into the factors as well. All right, so, all right, so now we're gonna say everything we're gonna look at right now is all a maturity. So that makes it really easy. Because all you have to do now is look at the marbling, the flex of fat. That's the same pictures that you have on this sheet right here. Okay, if you pick up that big sheet, have the chart at the bottom, you have at the top the marbling pictures. Okay, that's slight. So if an animal's A maturity and it has a slight amount of marbling, what grade is that animal? So what a grader is going to do is he's going to look at that place on that carcass right over there. He's going to look, and that actually is right here on that carcass. They're going to look at that ribeye and compare this picture, okay, to what they see there. And if it's slight, it's USDA select. Now, the, uh, there's one more point. Everybody listen up. This is going to help you. This is actually the very minimum an A maturity carcass can have and be in the select grade. It's that, that line right there. If it has more than that, we know it's at least select. So the next one is small. Everybody sees small. A maturity, small. What grade is that? Okay, it's choice. In fact, that picture is the very minimum for an A maturity carcass to grade low choice. Choice. Okay, how about the one up here in the middle? Slightly abundant. If it has that amount of marbling in that ribeye, what grade is it? Prime. So A maturity, drop down, slightly abundant. That's the minimum amount of marbling that an A maturity carcass can have and be in the prime grade. What if it has less than this? What grade? Everybody see that standard? So remember, I said that's the minimum for the select grade. So if it has less than that, it is standard. Okay, so let me set your eye because you're going to grade now. If it has less than this picture, it is in the standard grade. If it's between this picture and this picture, it's in the select grade. If it's between this picture and that picture, it's in the choice grade. Good. 
it's that picture or greater, it's in what grade? Prime. Prime. All right. All right. Help me. Let's go through these. Okay. Oh, I might talk about top choice. Let's look at your chart. So how many degrees of marbling are in the choice grade? One, two, three. You're going to hear a slang term used in industry for certified Angus beef, for example, that's an upper two-thirds choice. What in the world does upper two-thirds mean? It's modest and moderate. It's the upper two degrees of marbling. So of the cattle, upper two-thirds means that it either has a modest or moderate amount of marbling. We call that top choice. If it's small, we call that low choice. So let's go. What is top choice here? This picture. This is a money line here. This is a $6.50 per 100 pound money line right here. So go from here to here. If I get to this, it's now in that upper two thirds or top choice is another term more commonly called top choice. If it's that modest amount of marbling and A maturity, if it meets the Angus criteria, then it could be certified Angus beef. All right. So these are your options, prime, top choice, low choice, select, and standard. So grade this animal. How many think it's prime? Raise your hand. How many hands are broken? Everybody, just as a trial, so many of you can raise your hand. If you have shoulder problems, don't worry about it, but if you can, <laughs> raise your hand. Okay. So it's prime, pretty easy prime, and it's more than this picture, isn't it? I mean, big time, more than that picture. So it's prime, it's actually an Angus uh, Wagyu cross that we had at McGregor Research Station in Texas A&M. All right, so here we go, next one. So you ask yourself, is it more than this picture? Obviously, right? Is it more than this picture? Yes. Is it more? This is the minimum for top choice. Is it more than that picture? Is it more than this picture? Okay, how many think it's more than the slightly abundant picture? If it is, what grade is that? Okay, if it's less, what grade is it? Top choice, okay? So right now there's a $14 per 100 pound difference in that. So I'm going to call it, and I think it's pretty easily prime. Okay, because I think it's more than that picture. As I look at it, I see more marbling than I see in that picture. All right, let's go to the next one. What about that one? How many say it's prime? Raise your hand. Okay, top choice. Okay, it's prime. It's actually more than the last one. This is an Angus steer. All right, so how about this one? I think surely is everything prime? No, only uh, in the nation 10% or less, in Texas about 6 to 7%. No, this is also prime. It's more than that picture. That's all you're asking yourself. If it's A maturity, it's more than that picture. What, how about this one? Is it more than this picture? Right here, more than slightly abundant. If it's not, then it's not prime. So if it's, is it more than this picture? Is it more than this picture? So that's how you do it. It's top choice. Boy, you didn't know you'd be an expert grader before this is all said and done. All right, let's keep going. Uh oh, this is fat. Did I say anything about external fat being part of the grading system? No. The only thing that counts is it, what's inside that muscle. So as we look inside that muscle, what grade is this, do you think? How many things it's more than this picture? Yes, that's good news. Is it more than this picture? Uh, I think probably not. I will point out that actually marbling has to be totally encircled by lean. So this is actually not marbling, and this isn't marbling over here. So when I do that, I think it's less than this, but more than this. So it's a USDA select, a very fat one, but it's select. Okay, here's another select. Okay, not much marbling, but you can see a little bit right there. There's not much, and that's called select. These are just fancy terms to describe some amount of marbling. How about this one? How many think it's more than this picture? More than that. It's on the line. I like what Bobby's saying. It's kind of like this. But you know what? That decision's right now a $20, $26 difference per 100 pounds, 26 times 8 or 9. 
Wow. So if I call it choice, as a producer, are you going to be mad at me if I call it choice instead of select? No, I don't think so. Not if you're getting paid for choice. How about if I'm a packer, am I going to get mad? No. I want the best grade that I possibly can. Because I'm selling boxed beef, and I get a lot more for choice, and I have a lot of orders for choice boxed beef right now. That's kind of a misnomer, and what you just told me was what every producer group tells me. Yes, the packer really wants to put it to me. In reality, the packer wants the best grade they possibly can, and they're going to pay you for that grade. So whatever it is, it is. That's why we have that third party there, okay? But he wants those prime. He wants that CAB. He's, he works hard to get that because uh, he knows that improves his bottom line because I'm slaughtering an animal. I'm slaughtering 6,000 animals, right? And if I have 50 more that happen to make it into low choice today, my, that means out of that 6,000 animals, I have a lot more value because I have 50 more animals of graded choice instead of select. I'm selling the meat from these animals. Keep that in mind. How about this one? What grade? Is it more than this picture? Oops, let's go back. Is it more than this picture? No. So it's called ugly. <laughs> it's ugly meat, all right? So it is, it is standard, USDA standard. And they would be called, probably put into a box that I'm sure that um, uh, Ty will talk about called no roll here in a little bit. All right, now I, I just want to introduce dairy because there's a lot of dairy cattle up here. And dairy cattle, this is not a beef on dairy animal, okay? This is not a... One of those, and that's, that's, even, you know, that's a really good mix. This is just a straight Holstein, and this is the ribeye. And I will tell you, Holsteins on the quality grade side grade really well. A lot of those grade prime, a higher percent than in beef animals grade prime. So as you look at that, keep that in mind, as far as the meat grade, it doesn't matter what breed it comes from, it matters how many flecks of fat are inside that muscle and what's the age of the carcass or animal when it's harvested. Now there's some other things that we'll talk about that impact that. All right, so this is a question I usually get here before I go on to yield grading is where are we in our industry as far as what percent of our cattle have fit these different grades? And so what you'll see on the top here, these numbers is to date over the last nine months or where we are in our year, nine months, this is the percent of cattle that fell into these different grades according to USDA. This is also on the USDA market news reports. Okay, this is a dashboard that they put together. Today, or last, when they reported it last, which is uh, September 1st, that's the last data I got. I'm sure there's a new one today. But 72% are choice, 15% select, and eight, almost 9% prime across the nation. If we look in Texas, you'll see on average across that, well, look at the big numbers. Prime here across the nation last nine months, 10%, 4.5% here. That's our region. That's uh, Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Arkansas. Majority of those cattle are coming out of this, this area, this kind of tri-state area right here. So if you take a look at that, including probably a little bit of Kansas cattle that are being shipped down here, but you'll see that 4%, 66% choice, 72, 13% select and 26% select. So more select type cattle down here, fewer choice. Part of that is because of breed types. Part of that is because of the way that they're managed, the way that they're fed, the way that they're background, all sorts of other things. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Lawrence, he's gonna talk about growth technologies that may play a part of it as well. So when you take a look at that, what, just put these two together. That's 70% of the cattle in our area, either grade prime or choice. And 10% plus 72, we have over 83% of our cattle grading in that prime or choice category. So the majority of cattle are in that choice or better nowadays. Now here's a question I always get. What about these kind of cattle? Anybody raising Akaushi or Wagyu cattle in here? Okay. They are known for their ability to put marbling in the ribeye. And the main reason is, is that because of an enzyme that, that's a difference in the, their cattle versus normal, traditional cattle that we find in the U.S., 
They hardly ever stop putting marbling in the ribeye. As they grow, continue to grow, beef, our beef population, they pretty much plateau as to the amount of marbling they put in the ribeye. But this particular two breeds, they don't stop. That's why they're pretty old when they're harvested. A lot of times they'll get up to close to three years of age. They'll get really heavy, 1,600 pounds, 1,700 pounds, because they don't stop marbling. So why would I limit the amount of fat? If I'm going for fat in the, in the ribeye, why would I use my conventional production practices that I would use in the feed yard and harvest them at X weight or X fat thickness because I know that if I keep going with that, more and more of that marbling will be deposited over time. And so where is prime and choice? Well, that's probably in our world right here. And this is what the ideal, this grade five, and if you Google Japanese beef grading system, you'll get all this information plus some other things that go into that grade. It's more than just marbling. They also look at texture and color of fat as well. All right, now you're an expert at quality grading. Let's turn the sheet over. You have this sheet here. Turn it over to the other side, and let's talk about, talk about yield grade. So yield grading, remember, quality grading is how good the meat's going to taste. Yield grade is how much meat, what percent of that animal ends up in the form of closely trimmed beef. All right, so yield grade one is the best. Yield grade five is the worst. So best, worst, what do we mean? Well, best is highest percent closely trimmed boneless retail cuts from the round loin rib and chuck. You can just say lean meat yield. Highest lean meat yield. Yield grade five, lowest lean meat yield. So Dr. Lawrence, stand up for me. Okay, so look at him. Look at me. <laughs> look, at your, look at your pictures. Which one of us is leaner? More muscular, okay? No doubt, I can pick him out, he's turning red already. But you know, that's what's going on here. So we're, we're, you can look at animals, and we're gonna do that in a minute on these live animals, and you can look at those pictures and look at the difference in how the kind of muscularity, how much you see through the jowl, through the lower belly, you can look at Ty and us, never the same again. So you're saying, Dan, that you and I are you right No, you're a, four, you're a three, I'm a five, okay? Now, now Ty's a one. So, please forgive me, Ty. All right, so as you look at this, this is what we're saying. So you can, we're going to look at these cattle, and you can look at all sorts of things. You can say, that's fat and that's lean, that animal. We're going to go down through that. So just look at those pictures of those animals as you go from one to the other. All right. So what we're trying to determine is of that carcass, that side of beef, when that carcass goes through all these people that are taking knives, trimming fat, taking bone, how much ends up in the form of a carcass? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to estimate that. And that's what yield grade one is the best, five is the worst. So we're not gonna go into depth because we're just gonna kinda eyeball these here in a minute, but I want you to know the four factors that are considered in determining the grade of an animal. So again, we're looking at that cross section over there. If you look at that one there, we're looking at cross section right there. And so the first thing and most important measurement is how much fat is opposite that ribeye. By opposite, we mean as we go from the backbone side of the ribeye all the way to the other side, we measure the fat at that point. Let's see if I can get that, yep. How much fat is there? We've determined that as that animal has more fat in that location, that animal is fatter everywhere else, generally. It's not always the case, but the majority of the time it is. So we use this one factor as our beginning yield grade. And so notice if it has zero fat there, it starts out at yield grade two. If it has four tenths or even a half an inch, it's 3.25. If it has a full inch, its starting yield grade is a four five. So this is a very important part of the measurement as you look at it. All right, next one is weight. As animals get heavier, they tend to get fatter. So everybody look at me again. Stop laughing. I haven't even asked the question yet. So if I gain 50 pounds, is it gonna be fat, lean, or bone? <laughs> you guys are so kind. I have some groups that just yell fat. All right, you're right, it's fat, okay? So as animals get heavier, 
and they get in that rapid fattening phase of their life, they tend to get fatter, right? So as you take a look at that, that's why you see these pluses. So notice they start out with 600 pound carcass. Actually today, the average carcass is probably between about 850. So they're actually adding, starting out adding one full yield grade. Why are they adding? What's better, a one or a five? One's the best. So the further I get away from one, that means lower percent closely trimmed bone beef or lean beef. And so add a one. And so weight is an important part of that factor. The good news is on the other side is muscle. So that ribeye, so again, we're looking at this cross section right here. We're looking at that one single muscle. You can see the blue here. The size of that muscle is an indication of total carcass muscularity. And so as that animal has a larger ribeye, notice their minuses now, because the larger the ribeye, more muscular, higher meat yield. That's kind of how that works out. And then the last factor is actually that kidney, pelvic, and heart fat. If you can see that white right here, there's actually sometimes white in that pelvic canal. That's called the pelvic fat. There's the kidney. That's kidney fat right there in that lumbar. The heart sits right here. And so that fat there would be heart fat. So kidney, pelvic, and heart fat. And they look at the, what percent of that carcass is in the form of fat. That's what that means. All right, all that to say is what a grader is going to do is they're going to train themselves to kind of know this system, but then they're going to just eyeball them. And you guys actually have a cross section right here next to the cattle pictures of a one, two, three, four, and five. I want you to just eyeball these cattle as they're coming. Imagine they're coming across and you're going to grade them. So this is, these are your five options. One, two, three, four, five. A little easier than the last one. All right, so I'm going to look at this one. Remember, I'm measuring it from the bottom of the eye to the top, backbone side to the other side, taking a measurement right there, three-quarters of the way up, not halfway, three-quarters, and I'm comparing it to what I see here, 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 and here. So what yield grade do you think that is? That's a one. That's good. How about that one? That's a one. See, you guys got it. Is it that e it's that easy? Of course, you got to train for six months, and then, then you get paid like about $38,000, and they put you in a cooler for, that's at 30 degrees Fahrenheit for eight to 10 hours a day. So it's a good job. All right, so keep going. So we got this one. So what one is this? Okay, that's a yield grade two. Maybe, it, maybe a one still, but it's, it's close to a two. How about that one? Yeah, so again, we're comparing from the bottom of the eye to the top, three quarters of the way, and just taking a measurement at that point. And I think it looks a lot like that. How about that one? One, so we're making that measurement. Where is that three quarter mark? Is it here? Well, then it'd be a three, right? Is it here? Yep, it's about there. So it's that one to two. I'd probably call it two. It depends on how big the ribeye. So that's when the other factors come in play. Okay, just keep that in mind. But you can kind of get close. How about this one? Again, we're taking that measurement right here. Which one does it look like the most? The three. How about that one? Three. How about that one? That's still a three. There's another three. How about that one? Maybe we're getting close to a four. How about this one? That's a five. How about that one? That's a seven. <laughs> the, the, the best news for that picture and for me is the worst you can be is a five, okay? All right, so then this is the next question that I get. So I'm just kind of going through it. Okay, when we look at this fat as we go from here to here to here, what, and then we look at what, when we compare that and look at that fat thickness there and compare it with quality grade. So as cattle get fatter, they tend to have more marbling. So this is a, they don't always though. Remember that yield grade five that was a select? I mean, that didn't, just didn't have the genetics to do it. So what we did is just to kind of show, this is some data, two million data points. This is a project that West Texas A&M University and Texas A&M University did called the National Beef Quality Audit. 
And in that, out of 2,000 car 2 million carcasses, we broke them up according to fat thickness opposite that ribeye going across the bottom. So a quarter of an inch, three tenths, four tenths, one tenth up to greater than an inch. And if we look at the little uh, data points here, this is choice. So this is the percent of cattle within that that had that much fat opposite that ribeye that graded choice. The brown is select. Other would be that standard, and the gray line would be prime. So we kind of step up, boom, 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 bam. It kind of plateaus. Remember I said that in our general beef population, you kind of get to a place and they stop depositing marbling, which is different than Akushi and Wagyu cattle. Okay, so here, they kind of get there. Well, what fat level is that? Well, you drop down, it's about 60, 6 tenths to 7 tenths. Okay, what percent prime? We have about 4%. It does start to increase. And I think this chart, if we looked at the data and they're doing the National Beef Quality Audit again now every five years, I think we'll see that percent choice actually higher, percent prime higher, based off of some of the changes and shifts that we have within our cattle populations. But if you look at that, so as a feeder, I'm going to feed to the, probably the 6 tenths, the 7 tenths range. I'm going to try to look at a pen of cattle kind of get them to that average and then sell them at that range. Because I'll get a few yield grade fours, fatter cattle, but I got to hit that prime or choice because there's such a premium for prime uh, and top and CAB cattle. All right, so you guys are expert grades. Now, graders, let's transition this to now looking at live cattle. Okay, that's our next step. So next step, as we look at these cattle, there's some differences in breed type. Key is, is that when we take off the hide, we have to be careful, don't we? Because we can have a lot of biases right here. Okay, if I asked you which one of these two graded choice, I bet majority of you would say the one that was black. Some of you would say both. Okay, a couple of you that maybe are Charlet breeders might say the yellow calf. I don't know. So as you look at it, you have to always be careful because we're taking the hide off. That's, the, that's why I love being a meats person because I, I look at what's underneath that hide. So that, that's really important because we're going to eat the meats. We're not eating the color. Okay, but as we take a look at that, all animals, including humans, have, I don't know about marbling in humans, but all cattle have this kind of growth curve where you'll see that if we take a look at, at birth, the highest percent is muscle, then bone, then fat is very low as far as percentage or growth. As we look at an animal through time, if that animal had all the nutrition that it needed, didn't ever go backwards, just had the nutrition that it needed for maintenance and growth, what we'll see is it step up. This is muscling. Notice it grows quickly. Bone grows a little bit and then stays as a percentage at fairly consistent amount of that carcass. Muscle grows significantly, quickly, up to a point. Notice fat is just kind of like the, the train is just kind of chugging up the hill. And it's chugging up the hill and then all of a sudden it goes down the hill. Boom. At this point of inflection, I use a term called rapid fattening phase of its life that animal's life. That animal has entered into the rapid fattening phase of its life. Hey Lance. Rapid fattening phase of its life. So that's a really important point. When we look at cattle we're going to use terminology like that's a earlier maturing, later maturing, smaller framed, larger framed. And what all that surrounds is when will that animal enter the rapid fattening phase of its life. Okay, notice that marbling kind of trails. It's what we call a later fat depot. It actually, that animal will generally put fat on the outside of the animal, maybe between some muscles. And then over time, as it gets to a point, particularly around puberty, it will start depositing more and more marbling at that point. So it's later. So as we look at cattle, it's kind of like humans. Okay, when we look at growth, Believe it or not, these two people have the same body fat content. Okay, so they're different heights, okay, different weights, but same fat content. Same thing on cattle. That's why we talk a smaller frame, medium frame, larger framed animal. 
So here we have three steers. You can see at these different weights, small frame, medium frame, large frame. What we're really saying is when is that animal going to be ready to go to market? Remember that six to seven tenths fat? When does that animal reach that point? And smaller framed animals reach it at a lighter weight and an earlier time in their lives. Generally, earlier maturing, smaller framed. Okay, so as we look at it, this is an earlier maturing, smaller framed animal. That means it's ready to go to market earlier and with a smaller height, basically. Height that withers, frame. This one's medium, kind of in between these two. This is a larger frame. So imagine that this animal, its weight that we want to harvest this animal is 1,000 pounds and this one's 1,400 pounds. And this one is 13, uh, 1,300. Okay, so we have those all in the same pen. And these actually were in the same pen together. So what end point do you harvest those animals? What if we decide we're going to harvest them all at this weight? What's going to happen? They're going to be really fat, aren't they? This one is already fat. It's going to get really fat by the time it gets to 1,400 pounds. What happens if we take this one and we harvest this one now at 1,000 pounds? No fat, no marbling, no nothing. Okay, so we need to look at animals, and that's part of the value of being able to have, when you sell calves, have calves that are similar in size and breed type, weight. So as I buy them as a feedlot operator, I can manage them as a unit rather than trying to find the best average of that group. And if you go into uh, sell cattle at auction, you're going to find the same thing. You know, those cattle that are kind of in that medium, large medium frame, kind of that picture, you know, that, uh, that look like that they are, you know, have eaten, ready to go, you're going to have more people bidding on those cattle because they're kind of in that middle of the road category and they can put them in different pens to help mix those pens. Now here's two steers that I would like to use to help demonstrate this uh, process of large frames, small frames, earlier maturing, and later maturing. So we have Harold and Herman. Nobody in here has named that, right? Don't take this personal, okay? All right, so as you look at Harold and Herman, I want to ask you which question, this question. Everybody tell me, wh raise your hand. How many think that Harold is the leanest of the two? The answer is Harold is the leanest. How did we know that? Well, just look at your pictures right here. See the yield grade one, two, three, four, five? So as you look at those, and you look at that animal, look at the jaw, look at the brisket, look at the flanks, rear and four flanks. Just a big difference. Now I will tell you, both of these animals weigh within about eight pounds of each other, about 1,250 pounds right now. Okay, they harvested them. Okay, they pulled all the fat off of one side, and this animal ended up having 47 pounds of fat, and this one had 92 pounds of fat. This is a yield grade four. This is a yield grade two. Now, which one of these do you think had the highest quality grade? Quality grade now, prime choice select. Which one? Herman or Harold? They had the same quality grade. So there's some genetics in here, isn't there? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you were able to produce more Heralds and less, less Hermans? Because I probably, nowadays, probably could have fed Harold probably another 50 days in the feed yard. And if I have a good positive cost of gain in the feed yard, then I'm making more money by doing that. Okay, kind of simple. So which animal is larger framed, Harold or Herman? Harold. Which one is earlier maturing, Harold or Herman? Yeah, Herman, remember, early in maturing means it entered the rapid fattening phase of its life at an earlier, earlier weight. Remember, kind of the key things that we're looking at is we're looking at the ribeye size, we're looking at fat thickness, have KPH. As we look at an animal in other places, though, we look at fat in some kind of interesting places, okay? This is a cross-section, and this is a cross-section of Harold. Okay, right behind uh, the back leg. And so this is the round area, cross-section of the round. And so notice we have fat around the outside, 
We have fat in the crotch, cod region, and then we also have fat between muscles, intermuscular fat. We call it seam fat. Notice the fat level here versus here. And you could have just a little bit of fat here, but as you multiply and get one-tenth more inch of fat here, you could have a whole other inch of fat at that place. So there are other places in that animal that there's much more fat, the way that it develops. So here's a fatter animal. Actually, this is the yield grade, Iowa State yield grade picture. So here's a cross section of a yield grade four at the shoulder. Here's at the ribeye where we measure yield grade. Here's back at the loin and here's back at the round. All right, so where do we look at fat? Well, we're gonna look at how full the brisket is. We're gonna look at over the ribs. If we see ribs, we know that, remember we're measuring fat really right here. From the top, the backbone side of the ribeye to the other side, we're actually going this direction. We're measuring fat right here. How many ribs in a beef animal? There's 13 ribs. Here's the 13th rib right here. Here's the 12th rib. We actually rib the animal right between these two ribs. And so when we do that, we have the ribeye, we have a fat layer over that ribeye. So we're measuring fat at that point. A good indication of how much fat is right here is by looking at how much of the ribs, how much flesh, can we see ribs? How well can we see those ribs? And over time, you'll learn that when I look at this place, it gives me a good indication of fat there. And the last place that an animal places a lot of fat other than the jowl is back here in the hooks and pins region. Well, here's an animal, as you take a look at it, it has quite a bit of brisket, has more cod. Okay, look at the depth of the flanks. That's where you measure fats. So here's two animals. Forget about breed types, they're both red, okay? Let's take a look at it. Okay, look at this animal in this picture versus this one. Which one is the yield grade one? The one closest to me and the one furthest away? Closest, which one's the fattest? Furthest away. Which one do you think would have more marbling? Just should have more marbling. Okay, this one here, I don't know. We'll show you some other pictures that I do know. But you would just, I'm just natural. Remember as that animal gets fatter up to a point, if it has the genetics to deposit marbling, it gets more marbling. Okay, here's another one, same calf, this one. Okay, which one do you think is gonna be a higher quality grade? I would think this one. Which one do you think is going to grade select? One closest to me or furthest away? Closest. Which one do you think would grade choice? Okay, the, this calf. That's what I would think. Okay, one thing you're looking at, part of that is breed type. This is a limousine versus a red Angus cross. It's not a pure, purebred red Angus, but if you take a look at it, that's what you're looking at. And if you took a look at that, you're seeing the muscularity, you're seeing the uptake in the flanks. Very clean face, very clean brisket. So fatter and somewhat of the breed type difference, you can kind of think through that. Well, if I had to put my life on it, I would guess that this one would be choice, and it is. I mean, this is what the ribeyes look like on these two animals. Okay, next one. Which one of these do you think is going to grade choice? The red one or the white one? How many say the red one? Raise your hand for me. How many say white? Okay, now this one, two reasons. One, this one is a leaner calf. But it also, this calf would never stand still. This calf was running all the time. And so when you came to feed that calf, this calf was at the other end of the table. Okay, way down the other end of the pen. This calf was right up there saying, give me all the food you got. And I'm going to eat this guy's too, because they were fed together. Okay, and that's what it looks like. Okay, how about these two? Okay, which of these two, how much fat, which one's fatter, the black one or the, the uh, yellow calf? Cream color, whatever you call it. Okay, yellow, yep. See the brisket? See the uptake here, the face? Okay, this is what it looks like. And you, as you would guess, this one is high select. This one's low choice. This is a, a mate to that red calf. Okay. How about these two? Which one is fatter? Okay, this is called, this is when we get the term toad. This is a toad, okay? But, you know, this one has not much fat. This one has uh, pretty fat. That's that yield grade two. It's only choice though, but that group had a lot of fat. So muscularity, 
kind of talk about where we look at muscle. We're going to look at muscle through the round. Now, when you look at the round, it's really important to not look at just pure thickness. You want to look at shape of muscle. Because what's actually, remember that seam fat that's between the muscles? So as an animal gets fatter, they put more seam fat between the muscles, and they can just blow things out. They have more fat between muscles. So width does not mean anything. What means something is what is the shape of that width as you're coming through that muscle. Okay, same thing as you look down the top of an animal. Remember, there's a ribeye sitting under here, and there's a ribeye sitting under here. Okay, which one of these is more muscular? Okay, yep, the white calf, so, or, or gray calf. So if you look through here, basically a triangle. Okay, if you look here, it has that nice shape. Okay, looking down the top, you can see that's the ribeye. That's a pretty small ribeye because I can see that backbone coming right down the top versus this one, much different. All right, you'll grade one, two. Just kind of remember, these are the same pictures you have there in front of you on that sheet. Three, four, five. Last thing I want to talk about is two, two th terms and things that you see in the industry. One is Holstein. So what, we're having Holsteins, so let's talk about Holsteins because there are quite a few Holsteins fed in this region. Holsteins grade, quality grade really well. But what they have is more bone than the normal animal. Remember, the consistency of bone in a regular beef animal is about maybe 16%. And in a Holstein, you're going to see around 18 to 20% bone. So higher bone content. Also has less muscle. By less muscle, I mean different shapes, more angular kinds of muscles. So it doesn't look as good on a plate. So there are some yield as far as yield of meat differences between Holsteins and Beef, regular beef animals, but quality grade, actually probably in favor of Holsteins. How about now we're taking beef bulls and breeding them to Holstein steers? Okay, they're doing that because they're doing that because that's going to improve that calf. Well, if they didn't, that calf's, you know, you're lucky almost to be able to sell that animal in a lot of cases. So they're doing it to help. And, it, and as you look at it, it increases the percent choice. In those cattle, it also increases the muscle, and those animals are, depending on the bull that you breed them to, are generally somewhat, but not quite in the middle of the two as far as yield. They're still doing a lot of data. Maybe Ty's done more data on that than I have. Maybe he can tell us exactly what the difference is in that beef on dairy. As you look at that, you know, that's, that's the trend that you see. Now, let's talk about the Charlet double muscle cattle. They really don't have two sets of muscles. They have larger muscles. They have a different muscle fiber type. That fiber type, actually, the fiber bundles and fibers themselves, the muscle fibers themselves are larger, have a bigger diameter. It makes that animal more muscular. Okay, so nothing, and generally those animals do not deposit marbling very well. Majority of them are going to be in that standard to low select category, and, but they will be yield grade ones. Very good on yield, but not good on the quality grade yield grade side of it, or on the quality grade side of it. So with that, Ty, I'm done with this presentation. I don't know if you want to take a quick break uh, as we set up, because Ty's now going to come in and talk about growth enhancers, technologies for growth. And then he's also going to talk about other discounts and actually how we sell cattle on the rail on a grid. And then we'll bring, bring in some meat in for you guys to see.